to. But because there's going to be hundreds of people on the live stream and watching the video, the booming thing, if we use the sound in here, makes the audio so extensive to edit and harder to follow. We we're going for the intimate approach. Okay. And uh, what's up, Andrew? Now, uh, do you why don't why don't you say something about the conference and everything first okay. as we're getting before he starts proper to let everyone know. Yep. <clears throat> So this is Andrew Davis, for those of you that don't know that are new in the room this afternoon, and people uh, all over the world at different time zones. If this is your first time joining today, uh, this is Andrew Davis, and he is helping coordinate, run, facilitate, and uh, problem solve throughout the giant 50th anniversary for the Center for Process Studies uh, event this week. So I want to let him say a bit about it, and then we will introduce uh, Bob Mesley. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Trip, and welcome back, everybody. If you were here for the first session, we had a great time with Tom. There he is, and we're uh, looking forward to having Bob Mesley, uh, who has written one of the foremost um, purchased, I'd say, introductions to process philosophy and theology. So look forward to hearing from you. Uh, so I do program directing for the Center for Process Studies, and for over a year now, we've been uh, wrapping our minds around an endless amount of details to try to bring the next couple days into being. So if, if any of you are familiar with Whitehead's uh, famous mantra, the many become one and are increased by one. That's sort of how I see this event. It's a, been a collective endeavor, uh, many people contributing. So we thank uh, Trip, of course, Homebrew Christianity. We have EcoCiv, the Cobb Institute, uh, the Institute for the Postmodern Development of China. We have multiple co-sponsors who are helping us bring it into being. So uh, do attend tomorrow. It starts uh, in the morning from eight to nine. We'll be doing registration. There'll be coffee, time to look at books and browse some of the organizational tables. And then we'll be jumping right into uh, three days of interdisciplinary exploration of process thought. So hope to see you there. And, and for those on the stream, they have the opportunity of joining digitally Thank as you. well. Yes, thanks for that reminder. We do have a live stream that can be joined. It's uh, if you uh, simplest way is to go to the church's uh, YouTube page and hit the live button. So that's we're at the Claremont United Church of Christ, and you can find their YouTube page uh, quite simply. So hope to hope to have you involved. Excellent, excellent, awesome. Thank you. Now, Bob, you can come on up here. So uh, I'm super excited about this session. Uh, as someone who has been proselytizing on behalf of process for on the internet for 15 years in three weeks is when I started Homebrewed Christianity. Back back when you had to have a page on your website to tell people what a podcast was. Uh, episode eight of Homebrewed Christianity, I believe, was the first time Bob Mesley was on the podcast. And it back then you had to explain to the people you emailed inviting them on what it was. And you're like, thank you talk radio, but on demand, and you can pause and come back to it. And that was before iPhones. So you had to download it on your computer and then upload it onto your iPod or actually listen to it on the website itself. Uh, so, uh, you know, that means we're, you know, we're, we're like a month away from 15 years of well, digital friendship, Bob. Impressive work, Trip. Impressive yeah. work. And so um, everyone that's on the stream and such, uh, you'll get the email when you get all of the recordings and everything. We will put links to both um, uh, Mesley's Intro to Process Theology and Intro to Whitehead's Philosophy uh, texts, which are exceptional. Uh, whenever I teach uh, process theology or philosophy, I use his Intro to Whitehead book because um, I find it's really helpful when you're thinking about philosophical uh, theology or thinking about philosophy of religion, or then you're take, they're engaging the sciences that sometimes we are so, we get so invested in applying the philosophical vision we're attached to, we don't take the step back to watch its big picture. Uh, and, and so I, I was thrilled when uh, I lured Bob into introducing us to process philosophy today. So uh, what we're going to do, uh, Bob will take over. He will get, introduce us to some of the big concepts and such. Everyone on the stream, you can drop in your questions. Uh, put the word question at the front of it so Mason can uh, save it. After Bob gets done, we'll talk a little bit. and, and get Mason will turn his camera on and become the, the voice of the Internet. 
Uh, but we also have another mic over there for everyone in, in the room. So uh, it, it we'll have like concentric circles of growing conversation uh, through, uh, through the afternoon. Um, but first, uh, Bob's going to take over and give us a little tour of the philosophical vision. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's in, really, tripp has been doing important work on this, as he says, for a very long time. And all of us in the process community are quite indebted to him for that. I offer a few words of orientation here about what's happening right now. This is an introduction to Alfred North Whitehead's process relational philosophy. And Whitehead is the figure whose ideas um, provide the network for most of what draws this particular community together this week. But it's very important to understand that it's just, Whitehead is just one person in an ancient tradition of process thinkers. It's a process relational thinking, it's ancient, it's multicultural, and it's multidisciplinary. So you need to, to understand that. For example, in ancient Greece, Heraclitus said, all things flow. You can't even step in the same river twice because it's all flowing. And he had a student, by the way, who uh, I think must have been trying to get his PhD because he said, well, my, my master is wise and has said an important thing, but he didn't say quite enough because you, not only can you not step in the same river twice, you can't even step in the same river once because the river is changing and you're changing and there's no fixed river to step into and no fixed person to do the stepping. So you can't even step in the same river once because everything is really flowing. Well, that's about 2,500 years ago in Greece. So you can see process philosophy happening there. And the Buddha, about the same time in India, was one of the world's most formative process relational thinkers. Particularly, he challenged the long-standing and continuing today uh, Indian concept of the Atman as an unchanging reality, an unchanging self, which underlies all of the flow of your experience. And the Buddha said, no, there is no such Atman. There is no self, if that's what you, if that's what you mean by a self. As an eternal, unchanging entity, there's no self. What there is, is the flow. And that flow is relational. The world enters into you and becomes you. And so the Buddha is a tremendously important process relational thinker, 2,500 years ago then. Um, on the relational side of process relational thinking, many indigenous communities have very relational perspectives. Just to pick a single example, in Africa, there's a Yoruba proverb, I am because we are. What I am is what we are. Could be much more relational than that, right? And so even though today I'm going to focus on process thought, I want you to remember, oh, it's not just Whitehead. Uh, also, I want to put in a plug for Jay McDaniel, who I think is doing a long with trip here, but Jay is doing some of the most important work at reaching out beyond the tradition created by Whitehead and John Cobb and David Griffin to reach out and to find people who do process relational thinking, perhaps without any even knowing about Whitehead, but who nevertheless are doing something that is process and something that is relational. And they may not be philosophers. They may be artists. They may be musicians. They may be chefs. They may be childcare workers. They can be doing anything and be doing some kinds of process relational thinking. And he invites them to contribute to his website. And if you're taking notes, this is one of the most important notes to take. Open Horizons. Open Horizons. And he, Jay writes for that generously, but he brings in a lot of different people from very different perspectives to contribute their vision of a process relational world. And that's a really important part of this. So don't think that just because this particular conference is kind of honoring leaders of the process, the Whitehead tradition, 
that that's all there is to process relational thought. In fact, I want to quote from, I want to quote from Jay. If you go to the Open, Re Open Horizons website, type into the little box, 20 key ideas. Because Jay McDaniel has given a short list of about 20, of 20 key ideas in process thought. And I recommend that list to you very highly. It's, a very, it's different from what I'm doing here. It's the broader picture than I'll be doing. Uh, let me even read to you just a little bit from Jay's, from the end of that piece. He writes, process thinking is an attitude toward life. Emphasize, yes. You can't hear me? Um, okay, is, can they, has anybody else had trouble? I don't want to blow the mic down, but okay, I will speak up. I was speaking to the mic for Zoom. Hi, Zoom. But uh, I'll speak up to the audience who's here, too. Thank you, Barbara. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. I'll, I'll speak past the mic to you folks, and the mic will pick it up partway there. Okay, fair enough. And if you write across from me, if it's too loud, I'll, you know, do a little of this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Sorry. Okay. Jay writes, process thinking is an attitude toward life, emphasizing respect and care for the community of life. It is concerned with the well-being of individuals and also the common good of the, of the communities and the communities of communities of which we are a part. Process thinking sees the world as a process of becoming and the universe as a vast network of, to use a Buddhist term, inter-becoming. It sees each living being on our planet as worthy of respect and care. People influenced by process thinking, Jay writes, continue to seek to live lightly on the earth and gently with others, sensitive to the interconnectedness of all things and delighted by the differences. They believe that there are many ways of knowing the world, verbal, mathematical, aesthetic, empathic, bodily, practical, and that education should foster creativity and compassion as well as literacy. He continues, Process thinkers belong to many different cultures and live many different regions of the world, Asia, Africa, Latin America, North America, Europe, Oceania. They include teenagers, parents, grandparents, store clerks, accountants, farmers, mus musicians, artists, and philosophers. By the way, Jay does a great Elvis imitation. But um, So I wanted to share that with you before I start focusing on particularly a Whiteheadian concept of process relational thought. And of course we have limited time. I you know, used to teach a semester on this and just get started. So we'll just try to cover a few basic ideas. A couple times I will pause for questions, feel free to chat, including those of you zooming in, but also try to leave room at the end uh, for a little more extended questions and conversations. And since you're starting something at three, what time should we be thinking about closing up? You might give so a little thought to that. So we have at least 20 minutes or so between for people to stretch out. Ah, okay. And... All right. That's good. All righty. Uh, so here we go. Hmm. When you get done and you think, somebody asks you, well, what did, what did that guy do? <laughs> Here's something you might say. Uh, and, you know, me and you get a little confusing here because I'm going to say, what is it like to be you? And I want you to turn that around and tell the other person. Bob asks, what is it like to be me? Okay? Not me. <laughs> the you that's me. <laughs> All right? I want you to think about, what is it like to be you? Because... The reason I want you to think about what it's like to be you is because you are not an exception to the universe. You are not an exception to nature. You are an example of nature. Okay? 
So I'll be asking you to think, gosh, what is it like to be me? If I am not an exception to nature, if I'm an example of nature, well, what is it like to be me? So I'm going to be asking you to think about that, about these key concepts as we go along. First, process. No surprise. Secondly, relational. Then freedom and self-creativity. And experience, minds and bodies. Now, I was chatting before we started with Kathy, right? Uh, who was expressing an interest in theology, and I was giving her fair warning that I'm doing philosophy and, and Mary Elizabeth Moore is doing theology at three. But you see there's a connection between philosophy, what I'm doing here today, and theology. Because if you're going to have a vision of God at work in the world, you need to have a vision of the nature of the world within which God is working. And different visions of the world will fit with different visions of God at work in the world. So there's a connection between what I'm doing and theology. And Tom was doing theology this morning too. But So there's a connection. So I hope that'll make sense to you. And so let me um, take a drink of water and tell you how I got converted to process philosophy. And I'm going to confess that at the beginning, I was converted to process. And it took me a num uh, some, some years to really understand why it was important for me, at least, to add that little extra bit, process relational philosophy, process relational theology. And unfortunately, I'd already written my first book, Pro Introduction to Process Theology, before I really fully appreciated that. So it's not in the title of the theology book where it belongs, but the word relationship is in the philosophy book, Process Relational Philosophy. And I wish I'd had it in the title of the first book, because the longer I think about it, the more you understand that the process is inherently relational. There's, there's no other way to do it. And so you can't just skip over it. All right, well, uh, around 1970-something, and I was a graduate student in Chicago, and I was struggling to read Alfred North Whitehead's book, Process and Reality, which is, it's fair to say, one of the most difficult philosophy texts ever written. Uh, I, that's not an exaggeration. I got to page 120 and ran around the apartment saying, Barbara, I understood a sentence. But... <laughs> And that was true. But uh, we, lived, we lived in Hyde Park, right near Lake Michigan. And one day in the fall, I went out for a walk by the lake to think, what is, what is this about? What, is, what does it mean to say that the world is in process? And it was a gray day, like, a lot like this, but breezy. The lake was choppy. And I thought to myself, OK, well, what if the what what if what's the alternative? What if the world is not in process? I mean, what would that mean? Would it mean that oh, there's there's some mysterious Lake Michigan sitting out there waiting for water to be there, waiting for the wind to blow on it, waiting for waves to be choppy? I mean, what could it mean to say that that the you know, Lake Michigan is there, not in process? And I just suddenly had this powerful shift in my whole way of thinking and feeling about my existence in the world. And if I were, I'm sorry, I'm, there's no room. I was going to dance for you. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I, was, I was thinking, wait a minute. In fact, I was going to lift my foot for you. And I, there's not even room to fit, lift my foot for you. But I thought, the future does not exist. That's what process means. The future does not exist exist. It's not that there is a future that's already settled and just hadn't gotten around to happening yet. No, the future does not exist. There is no future there. Sort of like the, the no-self doctrine, you know, that the Buddha was advocating. Not only is there no self, there's no future. It hasn't happened yet. The future has not, it doesn't exist. You could add a footnote here, except as a range of possibilities. But where does that range of possibilities exist? In the present, <laughs> not in the future. It's present possibilities for the future. The future does not exist. 
and it just went right into my bones. And I thought, holy cow. I'm walking down the sidewalk, walking by the lake, and I thought, the foot that I'm about to put down on the sidewalk doesn't exist yet. Only the present foot exists. Oh, not only that, but the sidewalk in the future doesn't exist because there's no future in which the sidewalk can exist. Only the present sidewalk. And of course, that, wait a minute, no. You know, it just moment after moment after moment, wait, the next, the next moment doesn't exist yet. And I thought that my foot doesn't exist in the future, the sidewalk doesn't exist in the future. I went by Maury's Deli and I looked in the window that was becoming and I said, the pastrami is becoming. <laughs> I know, and I watched it become and the customers were becoming and the little slicing machine was becoming and everything for the first time in my life was becoming because the future does not exist. And I ran back home and got and walked up the three stairs to our, grad, to our apartment and looked down into the yard beside me. And I'm not real excited about heights. And I looked down and had that little bit of feeling that you're about to fall. And I thought, holy cow, time is like <laughs> a height. You're always about to fall but it doesn't. You don't fall into nothingness. It keeps becoming. The whole cosmos keeps becoming. It's incredible. It's mind-blowing. The whole cosmos is becoming, 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 way faster than you can click your fingers. Trillions of times a second. The universe is like a jazz combo, just becoming. <laughs> and I thought, how am I going to explain this to my wife, Barbara, back here? So, remember, this is 1976 or 7, so I went over and I got out a record. Some of you remember. Some of you may even have a record player now. You know, my son has one. My daughter just got one for her birthday. But I got a record, and I put it on the player and set it to spinning. And I thought, you know, without having thought much about it, growing up in my Christian tradition, I thought that the future existed. I thought that Time was all the same, past, present, future. It's all there. It's all fixed. It's all settled. It's as if God had stamped time onto the vinyl like all of that Beethoven's Night Symphony there on this record. And that it's all there. The present is just as much on the vinyl as the past is on the vinyl, as the present is on the vinyl. And, you know, from God's point of view, it's all there, fully actual. And that having come from a tradition that cared about prophets and had a bad, uh, bad theology about prophets at that time, um, I said it, it, the, way we, the way we tend to think about prophets is that they're on the little needle. Time is stamped on here. God can pick up a prophet and move the prophet ahead three or four grooves, listen to a few bars of Beethoven, and then come back and tell everybody what the music of the future will be like. And it's a terrible view of prophecy in any case. But I realized, oh, wow, I don't know what I thought before, but I do not believe that because the future doesn't exist. The jazz, the future is a jazz. I mean, the, the cosmos is a jazz combo. Yeah, there's a history. Yeah, there's some harmonies. Yeah, the past that you've been playing the last for the last half. You know, yeah, there's a movement into something, but we're making it up as we go. Right? And in fact, I mean, right now I'm making it up. I've got some notes, but I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> and you right here, you're thinking, and you don't know what you're going to think in the next moment. You can say, I have an idea what I'm going to think in the moment, but you don't know what you're going to think in the next moment until it happens. It's becoming, 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 becoming. So when I ask you to think about what is it like to be you, I'd like for you to attend to your own experience. Now, there's a lot to say about this. I know that you take naps, that you get sleepy, that your thoughts will want and all that. But, but what is it like when you're conscious and paying attention to your experience? Does it stand still? Does it exist in the future? Does it, in fact, become? I mean, that's your best test here. You are an example of nature, not an exception to it. Okay. Very important. And I, I might add here a word about this. I'm going to, Whitehead, when I say I, I'm really representing Whitehead for the most part, but I agree with Whitehead about the issues that I'm discussing here for the most part. That 
I'm going to say that your, your self is the, and we could use self, mind, soul, psyche. Sometimes there are good reasons for using those words differently. But right now, I just want to use them all to point at this flow of your experience, okay? That your flow of your experience, the you, is 100% natural, not supernatural. You are really part of this natural universe. That's why I can ask you to look at yourself to learn about the cosmos, okay? Think about Galileo for a moment. I, I used to teach Galileo in a science and religion class. And Galileo, Galileo, to our knowledge, was the first person to turn a telescope seriously to the study of the heavens scientifically. And although others had looked at the moon before him, he looked up there and he saw these lights that you, these shades that you and I can see moving across the moon. And he said, what is happening there? And the closer he looked, he still wasn't sure what was happening. But then he looked out his own window, at least metaphorically. And he said, I think I know what's happening on the moon to cause those shadows to move. It's the same thing that happens here when you have mountains. Imagine a valley with mountains, right? And here's the sun, and the sun comes up, and when it gets up high enough, the light comes over the tip of these mountains and catches the tip of those mountains, right? And the higher the sun gets, the sunlight on the mountains down here goes down and down until the whole valley is illuminated in light, and then the sun goes down behind these mountains, and it rises up and the shade until pretty soon it's all dark. And Galileo said, the same thing is happening on the moon. The, the moon has mountains. And this was horrible blasphemy because the earth was not supposed to be like the moon. The moon was supposed to be a divine sphere, perfectly circular, to demonstrate, to illustrate the eternity of God with his perfect sphericalness. And to say that it has bumps <laughs> is to say that it's nasty dirt just like the earth the fallen earth was horrible horrible blasphemy but you see the connection scientists have come to accept that what is true of us is true of the universe what is true of the universe is true of us we're 100 percent naturalists he didn't say that but i am and so when, we, when he studied the mountains on the earth, he could see what was happening on the moon. When you look at yourself, you are seeing an important example of what is happening with the entire cosmos. It's becoming. Okay. Yes, Whitehead and I know that you take naps. Okay. In fact, Whitehead said, Aristotle said, man, but let's say people, but people are the rational animals. And Whitehead had said, well, not really so much. <laughs> Human beings are only liable to rationality. We're only occasionally rational because we're only occasionally awake. I mean, we're only occasionally paying attention. And so Whitehead was keenly aware that you're not always conscious and alert and, you know, but that's okay. It doesn't violate our model because we're going to talk later about the connection between your experience and your body. All right? But you understand. So let me just pause just briefly. <laughs> Anybody got a quick question or clarification at this point? Okay. Anybody saying, I'm completely lost. Help me out. Okay. There's a good point. Uh, did everybody hear that? That pick up? Can you, can you, uh, science fiction movies would never happen if everything was stationary all the time. Now, I mean, science fiction really struggles with time a lot, right? But good point. I love science fiction. Okay. All right. Any other question for clarification before I go on? All right. Yes. So, I guess going back to your comment on time, so does process philosophy depend on kind of an a theory presentism view of time, or is there any work to reconcile it with? A more B theory type uh, approach. I don't think I know the difference between A theory and B theory. Uh, Theories like all past, present, and future are equally real and exist simultaneously. Okay, well, this is not a B theory then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Fair enough.
Uh, Whitehead, by the way, was heavily involved in, in, in discussions of physics uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And so uh, what he was, in fact, I'm about to come to quantum mechanics, okay? And keep in mind that I'm not a physicist, but I think uh, the aspects of that that I'll talk about are, will make sense here, okay? Um, all right, let me see where I am here. All right, so let me talk about the way and what it is, something that you're an example of if you are constantly becoming. If, if the world is indeed becoming, then what kind of world can become like that? Not just every kind of world can become like that. You have to think about what is it that the world is constituted of that makes sense. And, and Whitehead's answer was experience. Experience can become like that. Now, to do this, you have, Whitehead points out, to do the kind of philosophy he wants to do, to think about a radically new view of the world, you can't just use ordinary vocabulary because our vocabulary reflects the view of the world that we have, that's been around for a long time. And if you're going to change that view of the world, you kind of stuck. You can either create new words, which confuses everybody, or you can use old words in new ways, which confuses everybody. All right? Which is why his book's so hard to read. He's doing something really new and creative. But think with me as I work through this, to take the word experience and to say, okay, I'm going to have to stretch that word way past what I'm used to using it for. Okay? But start with what you're used to using it for your own experience. Start there and then work out, okay? Um, how about quantum mechanics? Not mechanics, that's a terrible world. Why do they call it quantum mechanics? Quantum physics. Um, there you go, quantum organics would be much better. But it's, it's a pretty well established physics now for the last hundred or so years that say a, a photon or an electron is a series of quantum events. I'm going to propose, so is your mind. It's a series of quantum events happening like, you know, incredible rapidity. And the other thing we know about that flow of quantum events is that no matter what conditions you impose on a photon or an electron, you cannot know exactly what it's going to do. Okay? quantum indeterminacy. You cannot know, and it's not because our knowledge is limited, is the claim, but because you really can't control what that photon or electron is going to do, because it is indeterminate. Now, the word freedom does not usually get used here because we usually confine it to human beings. And it's be, there's other reasons for that, because early natural science was rooted in a philosophy that rejected any kind of freedom in the natural world, so that everything was just completely determined. But think about this photon, a series of quantum events. And no matter what conditions you impose on it, you don't know if it's going to go through that slot or that slot, a slit screen experiment. Well, what does that mean about those quantum events? that in each moment, a quantum event arises out of the past, a very powerful past, just squeezing down on it, the whole past history of the universe, squeezing in on that little quantum event. And it must, in some sense, however you want to talk about it, confront a small range of possibilities for its own future, for its own, beco for its own becoming. And among those possibilities available for its own becoming, something is going to be trivially and boring, trivial and boring from our perspective. I mean, this side slot, that slot, nothing very interesting to us. It's going to have the power to choose. For a hundred years, they've demonstrated with experimentation that no matter what conditions you impose on those quantum events, they have the power to choose what they will become. Now, usually physicists speak about indeterminism. But if, if we mean the, power, the ability, the power to arise out of a past, confront a range of choices, whether tiny or vast, 
and to choose to self-create in that situation. When we're talking about humans, we definitely call that freedom. And Whitehead wants to say, freedom is not only real, it is inherent in reality. It is inherent in the deepest roots of this physical universe. And the becoming of your mind, like the becoming of a photon or electron, is an example of what this whole universe is doing, how the universe is becoming. Free self-creativity. Now, let's just be clear for a moment. Remember that little tiny protonic quantum event? It doesn't have much freedom at all. I mean, really, it's just minuscule, right? But it's not zero. It doesn't have much self-creativity at all, right? But it's not zero. And you have days when you feel the weight of the world constricting you and confining you and trapping you and there's nowhere to go. The past is pushing you, driving you, squeezing you. But you still have choices. In fact, you don't have a choice to not choose. You have to go ahead and choose, right? You have to choose. You have to create yourself in that moment. Even if every option open to you sucks, you have to choose. Okay? Okay, am I, is this... Pay attention to yourself because you are an example of the cosmos, not an exception to it. Now, for the sake of authority, let me turn to Stephen Hawking. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, uh, you know, Whitehead's pretty crazy, and I'm not too much less crazy. Um, but let's turn to Stephen Hawking. He was crazy in different ways. Let me quote from Stephen Hawking's book, uh, co-authored, on the grand design about what we're discussing. Notice he doesn't use the word freedom, which I think is very significant, that physicists just can't get out of that early 17th century thinking to talk about freedom. But he does say this, nature does not dictate the outcome of any process or experiment, even in the simplest of situations. I mean, if it can't control a photon, how can it control your mind? Rather, it allows a number of different eventualities, each with a certain likelihood of being realized. Quantum physics might seem to undermine the idea that nature is governed by laws, but that's not the case, he says. Instead, it leads us to accept a new form of determinism. Gosh, I wish he'd said a new vision of freedom, but he didn't. A new form of determinism. Given the state of a system, which could be a photon or a anything, or you. Given the state of a system at some time, the laws of nature determine the probabilities. But let's put in their possibilities, because all of the probabilities are possibilities, right? There's some more likely than others various probabilities of various futures, rather than determining the future with certainty. Okay? So, Stephen, Authority is a good person to ha uh, Stephen Hawking is a good person to have on your side in this kind of conversation. Okay, so, for electrons, small range of choices. For you, much richer range of choices. But you and the electrons share some important fundamental things, okay? Relational process, that electron must create itself in each moment out of its past, out of its relationship to its past, and out of everything that's going on around it. It's complicated here, there's some relativity stuff going on, but out of everything that's going on around it, it doesn't create itself in, in an utter nothingness. I hate to say vacuum's a little complicated there, but. Okay, and you are creating yourself in each moment, right now, right this, oh sorry, that was past, on to the next moment, okay. 
You are creating yourself in each moment out of your, your past and every relationship you have. May I ask the present audience here real quickly, or you can type it in chat. Think of something you're related to real quickly. Not, not, not I don't want a paragraph. I just want a word or so. What are you related to, folks? The ground. The ground. What are you related to? You can put it in chat. What are you related to? What? Trees. Trees. Your, I'm own your own body. Thank you. Yes. Other people. What? Space. Air. Okay. What else? What? Fear. You're certainly related to your fears and to the fears of others. Heaven knows in our society, we are related continually to fear, right? It's a powerful force that we are related to. Yes. Time. Now, this is the complicated part because I'm going to say time is the becoming and perishing of events. Time is. There's nothing underlying the, per the becoming and perishing of events. Newton thought there was, but Einstein said, no, there's not. What there is, is the flow of events, which is what I was saying about your mind and what the Buddha said about the self. So if we take time to be the flow of events, the becoming and perishing of events, then you have covered everything when you say time. We are related to the becoming and perishing of every event. And I've got some relativity issues here we'd have to talk about. Okay. I don't know why they call it a flow chart in management, that there is certainly a metaphor here, right? Because the chart is supposed to map out some kind of connectivity, which is like the coming and perishing of events. There's a connection in the causal connection here, right? All right, but you get the idea, and I'll, time is a nice one because time is the becoming and perishing of events. That's what it is. And so that covers everything. You are related to everything. Got some relativity issues to work on here, but let those go. Right. Yes, the cell phone, that's right. The beginning and, and the living with, and maybe someday, who knows? The per perishing of the cell phone as we know it now. It'll just be implanted in your brain. But anyway, you're creating yourself out of all of these relationships. Some of them are very distant. Um, the, these days, I always just said the Big Bang, but now John Cobb and Tim Eastman are making me think, I'm not sure about the Big Bang. Anyway, but... The whole past history of the universe has, has set it up for you to be here in this moment. Without it, without the formation of the earth, you wouldn't be here making this decision. Without the formation of the sun, without the evolution of life, without trees to produce oxygen for us. Nobody mentioned other animals, did they? Except for time, which covers everything. That nobody mentioned other animals. We're related to other animals all around us. In our body, we've got full of animals that constitute us, right? And every living cell in our body, right? Every single living cell in our body is affecting us because we're, you know, that's where our experience is coming from. All right. Um, I'm having too much fun. The time is flowing past way, way too fast for me. All right. Um, so you don't create yourself in each moment out of nothing. You create yourself to, you can't say out of the whole past history of the universe, that's true, because the whole of evolution of the, the evolution of the galaxies of the planet, okay. The evolution of human history, the emergence of your culture, the emergence of your family, the emergence of all the people you know, and all the strangers, and all those terrible people you, you know, and all those wonderful people. But there are people who are closer to you. There are things that are closer to you. There's the air that you breathe that is here and not someplace else. There's the water you drink that is here and not someplace else. There is the, there is most of all your own immediate past experience. Your immediate past, seeing an old friend and hugging them. Hi, it's really good to see you in real life instead of on Zoom. Nice, you know, right? And, um, when you hug that, when, you, when somebody gives you a hug, you respond to that event, good, bad, 
boring, threatened, fear, joy. But your own immediate past clearly is the most powerful relation to what happens to you right now. But you create yourself. And let me say a word when I, sometimes Barbara and I are asked to perform weddings. And I often sneak in a little of this process, philosophy, without naming it. Uh, sorry, I was not talking loudly enough. Because uh, I was at a wedding, so I was speaking softly. Uh, but I say to the bride and the groom, I say, and I quote John Cobb, though I don't give him credit, okay? He gets no royalties for this. But John Cobb said, a soul is not a thing. And I say to the bride and groom, a soul is not a thing. It is the flow of your experience. And for a long time now, I hope, you too have been creating yourselves out of your experience with each other. And in the years to come, more and more, you will be, each of you will be creating yourself out of your relationship with the other. So have a care what you give to each other for that self-creativity. Each smile, each frown, each kind or unkind word, each act of patience or impatience, each giving of joy is material out of which the other person will create themselves and out of which your relationship together will emerge. Okay. Is that what it's like for you? That's the question I keep putting. If that's what it's like to be you, and if you really are an example of the universe and not an exception to it, what can you learn about the cosmos? And if you want to ask questions about God, what do you learn about the kind of world within which the God you might be thinking about, it might could be at work? <laughs> what kind of, what does it mean for, you know, and that's come back this afternoon at three from Mary Elizabeth Moore talking about theology, but hope that makes sense. Let me just pause again for questions briefly. Okay. Can you use the mic so uh, all the people on the internet hear what you're saying? I, yeah. Just the, the universal human desire, it seems like in all relig religions and history, people are looking for some fixed point seems like there's this desire for stability, which kind of gets into the substance versus process thing. But I think just with process philosophy, what is then the substance or what is the fixed point with which you relate? Maybe it is the past, like you're saying, that's the fixed point. Or maybe it is certain laws of nature. Maybe it's certain things you can just bank on, you can just count on. In process theology, you know, we talk about maybe there's certain aspects of God that are fixed that we can really rely on. But I'd just like your comments on that. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning process and substance, which I haven't come to, and I've been trying to decide if I'm going to squeeze that in or not, uh, given the finitude of our conversation. Um, the fact that people want something doesn't mean it's there. So I don't feel obliged to say that there is a fixed point. The world is becoming, is there a fixed point? Now, let me cheat here a little bit and say Whitehead proposed, Whitehead started, started out as an atheist, and then perhaps because his son was killed in World War I, we don't know, but for whatever reasons, as he struggled to envision this, you know, this create this novel vision of the world, he became convinced that his picture of the world could not function without something similar to what we ordinarily call God. And people like John Cobb and David Griffin and Marju Suhaki and Mary Elizabeth Moore and Catherine Keller and, and my wife and a lot of other people have helped to nurture that in a variety of ways. And certainly, and so if, I, if we step into that, one way to say that would be in a process mode. It is an eternal, it is an unchanging fact about God that God loves us. But what's different about 
this process of relational vision is that in each new moment, the way in which God is loving us is responsive to the world, is new. The fact of God's love is the fixed point that you're asking about, I think. But what God's love looks like is constantly becoming because God loves us enough to deal with us as we actually are. How are we? Becoming. And so a fixed and unchanging love is terrible parenting, right? If you treat your five-year-old like they're a five-year-old, when they're seven, you're not going to get good results. It's bad parenting. It's bad loving. The fixed point of love has to be dynamic, has to be relational, has to be creative. And you could do the same thing with God's knowledge. The idea that God, see, remember I started with that record where the idea that God had stamped all of time on the record of past, present, and future. Is that a A plan? Is that an A? No, that's a B physics, right? All exist. Um, that's, then what do you say? Well, that way God can know everything, past, present, future. But if the future doesn't exist, what happens to God's knowledge? Answer, God can still be conceived as knowing everything there is to know. What does God know about the past? Well, what happened? More complicated about this becoming future, becoming present. So I'll sl slip by that a little bit because it hasn't happened yet. But what God knows about the future is what's true, that it hasn't become yet, that it's a range of possibilities that has not been chosen yet. So God knows everything there is to know, which includes knowing that the future hasn't happened yet. So there's something fixed that God knows everything there is to know, but it's a dynamic, constantly becoming knowledge about the character of the world as it becomes. And does that address your question? I'm not ask, asking if it answers it. I'm asking if it addresses it. Well, there's no, it's, the past is not a substance. So I'm going to use the word substance very carefully here. Um, it, has a, it has a technical meaning in this conversation. So it doesn't mean still point or comb point or something. Means, I'll explain it in a moment. Fix, yeah. Um, and I don't know about the answer to that because our understanding of the past changes. Our memories, my, I don't trust my memories nearly as much as I used to. Um, the way in which the past is taken up into the present changes because each it's a new creature in each moment doing the taking up of a different past because the past is growing, right? Uh, who said, the many become one. Okay, so the whole, all of every, all those quantum events in the universe are poured into the next, each, each new quantum event, each new moment of your experience creates a new moment. The many become one and are increased by one. So in that sense, the past is growing. So it's not quite a still point either, is it? I think the past is past. I don't think it's, I don't think the past is changing, but how it interacts, how we create ourselves out of it, how we feel the past in each new moment is new. So I think my answer is, as one of the people that you were asking about, is I live without what most people would think of as the still point. I think I live without what a lot of people mean when they ask about a still point. I, I don't have one. And in the introduction to that little book that I noticed you had in your hand about why I'm a process philosopher, and this is just me. This is not Whitehead. This is not John Cobb. Anybody else? This is Bob Mesley. Everything I care about most is in time. I mean, philosophical concepts, platonic, okay, that's nice. But I care about Barbara. That's who I care about. I care about my kids and my grandkids. And in varying degrees, because I'm seeing your wonderful face, I care about you right now. And, but I care about every time, you know, I say worship is an act. I don't know where I got this. Okay. Worship is an act of centering your life around what rightly stands at the center. And what rightly stands at the center is a very complicated question to figure out. And I have a lot to say about that. 
What right do I have to put my wife, my children at the center? And I think I have a right because they are part of the whole cosmos. If I look, you know, uh, it's said for a long time by the Buddha and lots of other people, if you look deeply enough into my daughter, Sarah, you will see everything. She's a window to everything. She's an example of everything. So I think it's all right that when I hug Sarah or hug Barbara, I am rightly centering my life around what stands, what rightly stands at my center. Okay. And that's a kind of a still point, but it's moving. It's, a, it's not very still, is it? I have to count on them to be changing, to be growing, and eventually to perish, I hate to say. And I just have to learn to live with that. I'm not a theist, okay? It's been an hour now, so let me pause. I've not even gotten around to substance or body oh, or anything. How are we, we should doing, definitely Chris? do those. This is yeah. great. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, please. From, uh, uh, being harassed on my text messages. Uh -huh. um, uh, one is uh, uh, is when John, uh, as a Wesleyan, uh -huh. was trying to nuance this contrast between wanting something settled and fixed mm -hmm. and shifting uh, to becoming and flow uh, in his what is it, radical Wesleyan theology. John's book where he develops the process interpretation of Wesley says that uh, a part of the shift you can even see in what, that what Wesley's resisting is the move from irresistible grace to prevenient grace uh -huh. because it, Wesley's notion of prevenient grace is one where you are already always nested in the gift of life's becoming from mm -hmm. God who is love. And so you, it, it's, but if it's irresistible, like fixed from the outside, determined at the beginning of time, then uh, you go in and out of contact with a settled reality from the infinite external to time God, prevenient grace, then you become more or less attuned and awakened to the fact that each moment of becoming greets you with the grace of possibility, regardless of what you're inheriting. And you can see how both of them can be read deeply in multiple religious traditions. But his, uh, as a Methodist theologian inher in inheriting Wesley, Wesley developed that in contrast to other forms of Protestantism that thought the power of God's love is expressed by it being settled before the beginning of time. And Wesley said, then you misunderstand the story of grace. Like, what is the whole Hebrew Bible? It is a story of God in relationship with a people. God chose covenant, right? And what is the image? Marriage that you were using. <laughs> what, what is it that uh, what you, you see in, uh, in the New Testament isn't uh, – you actually see in the New Testament a modification of new creation coming by intervention, right, shifting of the ages to the first fruits in Christ, and you come to participate in the mind of Christ in your living. Like, you see these shifts in there. And so John going like, no, Wesley was on to something. Protestantism valued a kind of security uh, that envisioned a God less than biblical. And so that shift of kind of irresistible, eternal grace to prevenient the gift of the possible in the present is a is one way of kind of getting at it. I always like the fact that in, in the Hebrew prophets, God is constantly saying, you folks have a choice. You can either keep doing what you're doing and suffer terrible consequences, or you can do something different. And I'm going to wait and see what you do. Am I missing something in the Hebrew prophets? Are there not choices to be made? Is there not a God waiting to see what choice you will make before Choosing how we express God's loving justice? That would it suggest there's some freedom in that choice, wouldn't there? Yeah. By the way, when I'm projecting back to the back row there, I get so excited even more. It's, I feel really <laughs> sorry for you folks right up close. Sorry. Um, but now can't hear me. Really, I can't believe that. I thought they would hear me in the next building. Uh, so, all right. Um, <laughs> That could be it. That could be it. She she already knows this very well. Uh, but let me let me pause then and just say: Is there anything else that before I go on, I want to talk about your relationship to your body a little bit and to the rest of nature there, 
I'll try to keep to that. And I do want to say something about substance. I re- it's, I'm glad you said it. I really need to say something about that. So you understand what the contrast is between process and, and what? Process or what? And so I should say a little bit about that. But they're big topics. So before I go on there, is there anything else you want to do, the person in charge? Oh, no. No. I'm, okay. I'm having fun, but you know, I'm a member of your fan club. So I'm like, oh, this is so much fun. I'm just taking my notes and <laughs> okay. having a good time. All right. Well, let's talk about you being an example and uh, not an exception uh, and about nature. Back up to Rene Descartes writing in the early to mid 1600s. And Descartes is commonly and reasonably referred to as the father of modern Western philosophy. You know, the think that I think, therefore I am, that's Rene Descartes. And um, so the father of modern philosophy on which modern scientific understanding of the world, the, the philosophy behind early modern science was Descartes' philosophy. Galileo led into it. They were, it's, they've had the Renaissance reaching back to ancient Greece, Greek philosophers like Democritus, who, and, you know, Galileo and Descartes just reached back. They grabbed Democritus and said, he's right. And they just jumped it over the next, you know, 20, <laughs> however, 21 centuries or something and said, he's right. And now we're going to dump that into early modern science. But it's philosophy that they're dumping into early modern science, not science. All right. So what was this? And then Descartes developing a philosophy that shaped the foundations of early modern science and continue right up to today. And one of the women in my condo building is working on a degree in clinical therapy and is concerned. Well, the very first time I met her, I said, I know what you're worried about. You're worried about this idea that everything is a machine and that you're treating your patients like machines, you're conditioning like machines. That's what's worrying you, isn't it? That, that's not an exact quote, but, and I don't mean that I read her mind, but it didn't take long for us to have an exciting conversation. And the other guy walking his dog says, I have no idea what you're talking about, but, I, but it's interesting going by. But that was it, because the modern clinical, you know, was approaching the world mechanistically, approaching human minds mechanistically. And she was troubled by how it meant she was supposed to treat the children she was working with. And it's making her dissertation very difficult. How can she, she didn't have process philosophy to help her. And if she did, it it might make it harder (laughs) because they might say, oh, that is scary. No, but um, so Imagine a couple of things Descartes said that are really important here. One, Descartes said that the, that reality, now we're we're just going to set aside God and the angels for a moment, but that mostly their part of your human mind is like, is is like an angel or God. Okay. It's supernatural. Descartes said the physical world has no experience at all. Zero. None. Nothing. It is little hard things. Think of them as billiard balls or marbles or whatever it is. Little hard things, little atoms moving around in empty space and they space and they bump up against each other. And that's it. That's nature. That's what nature is. And because If you knew enough about where every little billiard ball was and how fast it was going in what direction and what their mass was, and then you had, he didn't have a computer, but then you knew enough and could do the math, you'd know how every billiard ball was going to bounce forever and ever and ever. And it's completely devoid of experience. Human minds, he was therefore forced to conclude, but being a good Christian, it was an easy conclusion, Human minds are not part of nature. Human minds are supernatural. They are exceptions, not examples of nature. Human minds 
in Descartes' view, were, were supernatural. In no way really participate. That's, they're not participating in nature. So there are mental things, like your minds, and there are physical things. Okay? And physical things exist in space, but have no experience at all. He said they don't think because he was a rationalist and was interested in reason. But we rightly extend that to say, because he would say, animals don't feel anything. They, they're robots. I mean, he's literally said that they're robots. And they don't feel any pain. They don't feel any pleasure. A bird doesn't enjoy singing. A fish doesn't enjoy swimming. They don't enjoy eating. They don't care if you kick them. They squeal because the gears, you know, get out of line. And imagine the impact of this for ethics, right? It's called animal research. <laughs> if animals don't feel any pain, of course you can vivisect them. Tie them to the table, cut them open. They're just squealing because their gears are getting mixed up. There's no experience at all in nature. That was Descartes' serious view, which shaped modern science and still does shape my neighbor's struggle with clinical therapy. <laughs> All right? And it shapes the conversation that physicists have about what they're doing. And I often think, do they really mean what they just said? Or is it just that they're stuck in an old metaphor? They have to talk about indeterminism because the word freedom only applies to human minds, which are exceptions to nature. Is that what's happening in their vocabulary? What would happen if Stephen Hawking threw the word freedom into his description of natural law? If freedom means arising out of a past, confronting a range of possibilities, and having the power to choose between them, well, that's exactly what Hawking is saying that quantum events do. So why doesn't he use the word freedom? It's not for scientific reasons. It's for philosophical reasons, right? I'm getting a lot of nods over here from, you know, the Center for Process Studies. <laughs> All right? Because it's for, it's for inherited philosophical reasons from Rene Descartes and from Democritus back 25 centuries ago. And it's nothing wrong to be bad to be 25 years centuries old. The Buddha was 25 centuries ago, and he knew better than this. <laughs> he knew that that's not what it's like. Okay. Now, the other thing... And so then when I ask you, what is it like to be you? What I want to ask you is, is it like you that you have a mind which in no way interacts with your body? Now, imagine this was a real problem for Descartes and all of, his all of his followers. If my mind thinks but is not in space, it can't push on my brain. It can't pull any levers. It can't push any buttons. It can't fire whatever they thought the brain was doing. My mind can't do that because it's not in space to do any pushing or kicking or squeaking. And if my body is in space but has no experience, well, it can't push on the mind because the mind's not in space, so there's nothing to push on. And it can't send an idea or an emotion or a physical sensation to the mind because the the body hasn't got any of those to pass on. So there was no way to connect the minds and the bodies. And Descartes said, well, there's this little pineal gland in the back of the brain. Maybe that does it. And everybody goes, you've got to be kidding. Why is the little pineal gland, is it not physical? Well, yeah, okay, it's physical. Does it have any experience? No, it doesn't have any experience. So, and Princess Elizabeth wrote to him and very politely said, I know I'm just a woman and I don't know anything. But does this make any sense? <laughs> right? Okay. So what Whitehead's proposing, go back to that uh, little quantum event that's forming electrons and protons and neutrons of which your body is made and forming and evolving into living cells. Whitehead's proposing this incredibly crazy, crazy idea that experience is not confined to human minds but goes all the way down. It gets more and more trivial as you go what we would say down or to reverse it as you go 
The meaning of up in this sense is experience that's more complex. The meaning of down is experience that's less complex. Okay? So, as nature has, nature has evolved many creatures with vastly more experience than electron or a proton. But the proton and the electron, they, Whitehead wants to say, think about saying that they have experience. What do they have experience of? Spatial temporal relationships. That's it. And anybody remember the other thing they have an experience of? It starts with a P. It's not fair, is it? Possibilities. Possibilities. That was cruel. I don't know why I did that. I'm sorry. Um, possibilities. Well, that's interesting. We don't think of that as physical. But uh, the claim that White is suggesting is that that quantum event forming an electron is experience temporal spatial relationships. Not love, not hate, not happiness, not sorrow, because it's too simple for those things. And possibilities. And that through the evolutionary process, those kinds of electrons are structured into two kinds of structures. Descartes said the two kinds of realities. There's minds and there's bodies. David Griffin, building on Whitehead, said, well, let's rethink that. Let's say there aren't two kinds of realities. Let's say that nature creates two kinds of structures. One kind of structure like the structures forming this table, my watch, a rock, these walls, those structures do not increase the, ex the complexity of experience or possibilities or self-creativity of any of the elementary particles of which they are composed. They're just piles, well-cohesive piles of things that get very complexly structured into planets and stars. But the level of experience is still at the elementary level of the protons. So a rock isn't thinking. It's not happy or sad or anything because there's no level of experience higher than the electrons and protons. Same for the table. So, so Descartes wasn't completely wrong. There is a physical universe that's not happy or sad or doesn't feel any pain, and you can kick a rock and take an ax to the table and it doesn't feel any pain. But he thought that was a separate kind. What David Griffin points out, based on Whitehead's thought, is, no, that's just a kind of structure. The other kind of structure that Descartes mistakenly thought was a metaphysically different thing, the other kind of structure is biological. And in biological structures, complex experience becomes more complex. Experience has more inputs, has a richer complexity, so that living cells can have experience way above the level of an electron or proton. And that living cells, you know, so that an amoeba can avoid, can, you know, and can seek food and run away from things. And we might even suggest that the amoeba, without being exactly happy or sad, has a preference over being eaten. It would rather eat than be eaten. It's not thinking about it. It's not doing philosophy about it. It's not very complex, but it has a preference for eating over being eaten. As simple as it is, it's not zero. It's something more than the electrons have. And when you put those together, you get bees. I got to tell a great study of bees recently. Maybe you've read this. They already knew that bees could communicate by dancing. I was going to dance for you earlier, but there's no room. But that bees communicate by dancing. They can communicate a food source at a distance. And the way they dance says what direction it is and how far away it is and how to find it. I love this. But here's the really part. They, somebody discovered that bees like little kinds of balls little kinds of bits of sand or whatever it is that they found. They like to stand on them like a logger and roll them around. Now, we say like. Modern psychologists would say, you're just projecting. And I say, well, all I'm doing is saying I'm an example of what the bee is. We're part of, we're part of the same thing. But they tested this by, by creating, you've got a beehive over here underground, 
they dig a tunnel to a source of food for the bees. Bees go back and forth. Very mechanical, they get food. But then they made a little side tunnel with a little room in it. And they put some little tiny balls. I don't know what the balls are made of. Little tiny balls on the floor in that little side room. And you can anticipate what the bees did. What did they do? They want to take a guess? They danced. They had a party. They little took off the side, went off to the side, went to the side, got onto the balls and rolled them around. Then they eventually get off and go back in and get some food and go back home. What a terrific thing to discover about bees. They play. They play. And there's so much research showing that animals play and care for each other. You, you're, if you're here, you probably already believe that animals can care each other, you know, that elephants can, be, can care about, you know, wounded other elephants, that they can care about children that are not their own, that chimpanzees, you all know about Jane Goodall, right? And you know that the animal world is complex and rich. And that just doesn't fit into Descartes' world. But if you are an example of the world, and if the bees are examples of the world, and if the dolphins and the whales and the bats and the rats and the amoebas are all examples of the same nature, then you're on a spectrum. And you're an example of that nature. Okay. And so then... For the theologians among you, they're interesting questions. Ah, how can God engage with a world of experience, a world of relationships, a world of, safe, of self creativity, differently than God might engage with a world on which mental substances have nothing to do with bodies? So now, one lad, I'm going to quit after this. Substances. The technical notion of substance here comes from Descartes. And he got that from, from Aristotle. But um, if you think about it, think it simply, I wish I had a pencil, but that's all right. I'd like to eat it. Um, think about a pencil or an object. I got it. Let's take a ball. Okay. I got this little cap. It's an object. The cap is green. The cap is round. The cap is not flat, it is indented. The plaque, flat, uh, the, the cap has little things, ridges along the edge. It's made of plastic. We say the cap, and then we describe it. Well, what if we change those? Now, this is what I love to have a pencil in class, because I say the pencil is so long, it's got graphite, it's orange, it's got a little metal band, it's got an eraser, and then I bite off the eraser. So, okay, so we change the description. The pencil does not have a metal band. The pencil does not have an eraser. The pencil was blue. And then we scratch, I scratch off all the paint with a pair of scissors and say the pencil is not blue. Okay. Then I say, imagine coring out the graphite in the middle. The pencil does not have. Well, is it the same pencil? It's not a trick question. It's a grammatical problem. Our grammar, our English grammar, not Chinese grammar, by the way, our English grammar implies that there is a substance which remains unchanged underlying all of those changing qualities. But the cap, the pencil, the Kathy, the Dan, that that substance remains unchanged through all the changes of qualities. It stands under them, but it doesn't participate in them. In India, that's what the word Atman is about. There is a substantial, eternal, unchanging self. And the Buddha said, no, there's not. There's no such thing. There is the flow of experience, the relational, self-creative flow of experience, and there's no unchanging substance under it. And I think that that difference matters, and so did Whitehead, and so does John Cobb, and David Griffin, and Tripp, and everybody else, right? 
And so you might think about, if you're caring about God here, how does God engage with the world of unchanging substances that are not connected to the physical nature, that couldn't evolve out of nature because nature has no experience? How does it, how might a God, what would the possibilities be for divine engagement with such a world? That's this afternoon's question. Yes. Can we use the microphone? Please. Yeah, sorry. And then we got a few more, we another 10, 15 minutes, and then we need to close, Mason, right? You got sorry, it's hard for me to quit. Yeah, from the chat. Sorry. So I'm really intrigued by what you just said. Um, and I'm thinking about my own experience mm -hmm. and wondering if it's at all exper um, experientially the same as a divine experience, excuse me, where maybe a divine entity um, <clears throat> has an unchanging character. Would a human Atman have an unchanging character or essence in addition to their changing attributes? I am very reluctant to speak for about 10,000 years of Indian tradition, <laughs> okay? So I don't know if I really want to bravely talk about Atman. I live two blocks from a Hare Krishna temple, and they don't even talk about it in some of this the same way that I think other people from India might. They have their own things. But So let me talk about Rene Descartes. <laughs> And I don't even think he can make up his own mind about how to answer your question. But I think the theory is that, no, there is an unchanging substance and it does not change because the changes are qualities. And the whole point is that it stands under all the changes of qualities. And I think what you're suggesting is that doesn't make any sense. What would it be if you took away every quality of your experience? If you took away every single quality of your, anything at all that you could possibly identify and name, wouldn't, would there be anything left? If you can name it, well, it's a quality and you've got to take, pull it out. So I think the trick, and I remember, I'm, I'm a process philosopher. I'm not a substance philosopher, so I'm not, they're not equally represented in this conversation. Fair enough. Go ask a Cartesian if you can find one these days, but... So I don't know the answer to your question. Descartes did say, I think, therefore, I am. And that's true every time I think. Well, and he says, and if I stopped thinking, then I wouldn't exist. Which seems like a very processual thing to say, doesn't it? And Princess Elizabeth picked right up on that and said, I know I'm just a woman and I don't know anything, but that doesn't make any sense to me. So I don't want to pretend that I, I'm giving you a fair answer about how Descartes might have said it. But I think his categories seem to say, no, it would have to be unchanging to be the Atman, the substance. Am I getting at your question? And not? Oh, use the oh. mic if you're going to talk. Oh, I, I want to, maybe I want to come back to God in a second here. Yeah, I'm thinking of like qualities that we um, attribute to God, like love, hmm. for example. Okay. I think, remember I said, you might, a process theologian, I think, would say that it is an unchanging fact about God, that God is all loving. But because God is related to the world, God shares the experience of every creature in the world. God is constantly reacting, engaging with the world, and so what God's love looks like in any moment is different, but it's an unchanging fact about God. So you could say abstract and concrete. I kind of doubt that human beings are like that. I don't, I don't incline, I don't find myself being that, that consistent, but you'd have to check your own experience and see what it's like for you. But I think the idea for God here would be illustrate what you're saying that there's, it's a fixed fact about God, an unchanging fact about the character of God, that God is, un, it's, that God loves. But because God is engaged in the world, that change, that's changed, how God acts is constantly different. Yes. Um, we got, sorry. He, Mason's going to hand the mic. Mason with the mic. While he's passing that around, I know there have been a lot of questions on the chat. Yeah, uh, please. But 
the next three days there are ongoing live streams and such and they is it friday i believe is all the sessions are on process people that are scientists so there's a number of them are very specific science questions um it's a i'll just say you know there's gonna be there'll be a whole bunch of physicists and, and biologists i'm not one and so I, I saw those and they I, and I got messages saying, Trip, you're not answering the science and religion questions. And and there's physicists asking questions. Well, sorry, physicists. I yeah. Anyway, I didn't want you to feel ignored. I also wanted to plug. You can come stream with all the process physicists on Friday. Okay. Anything else from the Zoom people that we should definitely address? I am looking um, at you Zoom people. You're very yeah, I'm trying nice to see if there's there. anything uh, that kind of relates uh, with what you've been talking uh, about, like substance metaphysics and everything. Um, let me look through and I'll, I'll okay. sort through questions. Thank you. I saw some hands right there. Oh, okay. Yes, well, uh, I think one of the things we might need to explain with a process worldview would be the continuity that we kind of experience, though, huh. over time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we, we sometimes say when someone is going into dementia, we'll say, well, I went to visit her, but Mary's gone. What's left is the shell, but Mary's gone. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of because that continuity of experience seems to have dissipated somehow. Mm -hmm. So do we account for the continuity some way that makes us have that internal intuition of self. I think the answer. I think the answer would be um, that you are. I'm going to say your mind, but let's say yourself, your soul. Choose your word here. Is the cumulative that gives you some stability, right? The cumulative flow of your body's experience and. Our bodies, not just ours, of course, but biological bodies in different ways, but your body is organized so that I'd say every living cell in your body is having some kind of experience, and directly or indirectly, that experience is channeled up into the brain, and the brain does fascinating stuff with it, which gives rise to a, an incredibly rare kind of flow of experience, which is conscious, which is amazing. Most of our experience is unconscious, mm -hmm. but it crosses a boundary of complexity into consciousness. And that allows it to do some kinds of experiencing that are largely mental rather than physical. But nevertheless, I would say with that proviso, which is important, because you can do math and philosophy and get absorbed in your thoughts and hardly notice your body at all, okay? And when I play pickleball, the arthritis in my knee disappears, okay? But it is still the flow of your body's experience. And when your brain is disrupted, it cannot produce the same character of that coherence of continuity. And this is sad, but I think that's how a Whiteheadian approach would come at it. Mm -hmm. It's a very complex question. How does the brain do this? Gosh, I don't know. Nobody knows really, but it's, but it, it, the brain is doing something, but it comes out of our whole body. And when our brain can't do that anymore, things change, right? So, and it's, you know, I, it's again, okay. Other, yes, right here. Thank you. I'd like to go back to the openness. I mean, I'm the, the fixed point uh, question because I, for me, the one of the deepest um, satisfactions of process thought is its commitment to the openness of the future. And that does seem to me to be a fixed point and a reason for hope because... Oh. Given the continuity and the the pessimism that can arise from looking at the way things seem to be headed, we know that freedom is operative at every moment, and therefore the openness of the future is a reason for hope. 
And yes. I, that seems to me to be a fixed point and a very profound, spiritually significant fixed point. A little, uh, yeah, it's a little different sense of fixed point than I was trying to answer, respond to before, but, but I'm happy with that, and I love that answer, of course. I, can, I would definitely agree with you. Yeah. The past is terribly, terribly powerful in shaping the future. We can't ignore what has come before, but there is still freedom, self-creativity, a range of possibilities. Thank you very much for saying that. That's true, but hope makes a difference. Yes, sir. Here, let, oh, uh, I know Mason. We want to make sure we get some of the questions yes, from please. people in the stream before. Yeah, because they can talk to you between sessions. Yeah, that's right. Face. After I go to the bath. Yeah. So there are. Uh, there was one question that is sort of along the lines of what you just answered um, around uh, a hope and how we kind of think about hope when it comes to the future and process thought. Uh, along those lines. Uh, there, there is a way of thinking about process theology without God. And I know as we've been talking in this conversation, for the most part, there's been this assumption around God. But there is a way to think about process theology without God. In, in that case, how does process theology think about things like novelty and value and hope without uh, maybe this actual entity uh, of God in process thought. So um, yeah, how, how do those process thinkers that don't think about God or have God as part of their their way of thinking uh, about process still have value? Like how, how do they think through value, novelty, hope, those sorts of things? Hi, I'm one of those. I think they were reading your notes. Yeah, they're reading they were my like, notes. oh, what has he not got to? Yeah. Let's ask the question. Yeah. Uh, that's right. There are process thinkers who are theists. John Cobb, Marjorie Suhaki, Mary Elizabeth Moore this afternoon. Where are you? On the I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, I think you're doing the homebrewed Christianity. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah that's right. Anyway, and there are people like me who think that process, that Whitehead's vision can function without the God he envisioned. And so this, from a philosophical point of view, this is all about the status of possibility. Mm -hmm. Whitehead thought that you had to have God to make novel possibilities available. And that's a long conversation. But I don't think so. And so your question, whoever asked that, is, is right on target. And for me, for Whitehead, possibilities come in awful, very platonic, fixed eternal forms, like two plus two equals four, the character squareness, and so forth. And I'm not a philosopher of math, so they don't fascinate me. But the possibilities that I'm interested in, possibility is what, and this is only part of the answer. I'm, I'm cheating a little bit on Whitehead here, but a possibility is what could happen given a past, given a past, an actual past world. Mm -hmm. That's what a possibility is. If the past actual world doesn't give you any resources for that, then it's not possible. But the past actual world gives us enormous resources, enormous resources for possibilities. And the fact that we have these bodies which experience pleasure and pain and hope and despair, and that we discover the consequences of cruelty and of kindness. So part of the important part of the answer is that I, as an ethicist, I'm about the consequences of our actions. Values arise as we contemplate what will happen if we act in certain ways. And there are a lot of philosophies that don't do ethics that way, mm -hmm. that ethics is all about eternal principles. Like you never lie, says Kant. You never lie no matter what the consequences. And I just can't go down that route. I think it's about the consequences given the actual world. As the actual world changes, we have to rethink what will happen because of our actions. But I think that is rich, fertile ground for values. And there's a long conversation to be had here. Glad to have it with anybody. How do you have committed values in a world of change? I believe it is possible. Okay? But there are committed values within a world of change. Mm -hmm. 
not drawing in committed values, my world beyond that. You, you have to use your best experience to anticipate what is likely to happen. No, you don't know what will happen. You use your best knowledge and experience and muddle through living with the fact that you don't know. And we're all doing our best. And as we know, we don't even know what will make us happy a lot of the time. We screw up a lot. But so we don't know what will happen. But we can anticipate with reasonable thoughtfulness the difference between raising my children with, with abuse and cruelty and, and erratic behavior as different from raising my children with love and compassion and listening and flexibility. It doesn't take a genius to see that those are going to make big differences in the lives of my children and grandchildren, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know the future, but I'm pretty confident about those. Right. Um, I, I one last question here, and then we, we could take a break. Um, almost 15 years ago, the first time you were on the podcast, um, when talking about uh, this this uh, it, this kind of increasing engagement with new depths of value and possibility in your life, you talked about uh, you knew you could use the word love, but you didn't know how to use it correctly until you you met Barbara. And then you're like, ah, this is what this word entailed, right? And then you were like, oh, we love each other and we get married. And then you held your child. Yeah. And you're like, oh, oh. Now you have hinted at grandparenting <laughs> and such. And I, I – I, I would love for you to kind of ex, kind of pick back up that theme of how it, it it is in the actual flow of existence that there's this increasing depth dimension you come uh, you come yeah. to know, uh, and on on good authority of almost all the grandfathers I know, there's a whole depth that they look at you. They're like, I told you know your parent looks at you and you're like I told you you had no idea what love meant until you held my grandkid, but wait, it levels up. So, so that kind of using that kind of intergenerational familial love for discovering depth, like how do, how do you see it now? I noticed you asked that just when you said that we should be wrapping up at 20 I, minutes. Well, yeah, you don't, if I asked it at the beginning, you wouldn't have got to any of your points. <laughs> I, so it would have been the... <laughs> I don't have any, any real words for that. I, uh, I don't, I, I, I agree. It's, 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 it is very, it's so wonderful being a grandparent, you know? So I don't think I really want to try to answer that. Grandparents will figure it out for yourselves because you are examples, not exceptions of grandparenting. It's a great question. Well, I don't have any words for it. Um, I will say, as I tried to say before, when somebody asked about still point, the first moment that I held our grand, our daughter, Sarah, I mean, I, when she was born, I was in the delivery room. I went out. I used all my quarters to call everybody. And then I went back in and I held her. And the whole world suddenly clicked into shape around Sarah. Sarah matters. That's what I thought. That's what I felt. Sarah matters. And I don't need a philosophy to tell me that she matters. I don't need a theology to tell me that she matters. I don't need an ethical system to tell me that she matters. From now on, that is my still point. Sarah matters, period. That's it. And it's all tied up with Barbara's mattering. And then when Mark came along and my grandchildren are part of the same still point, Sarah matters. And if you look deeply enough into Sarah, you'll see everything. And I can do it badly. <laughs> like any parent, I can screw it up. I can do it terribly. But that's my fixed point. But it takes me into everything. It takes me into you. I look across and I say, if I see Sarah's face there, then I know something about how to treat you. And that's if I, you know, Parker, Charlie, you know, Elliot, Asher, it just, it's not new, mm -hmm. but I think I'll, I'll um, I was going to close. Uh, let me close with a passage from the, the Hindu scriptures. Um, it's an ethical challenge for us, but if you're going to talk about Whitehead's God, I think God is the infinite exemplification of this vision in the Hindu scriptures. Those who burn with the bliss and suffer the sorrow 
of every creature within their own hearts, making their own each joy and each sorrow. Them I hold the highest, for their every action is wed to the welfare of other creatures. I struggle toward that by saying, there's Sarah right there. There's Mark right there. How will I act now? And if God has the capacity, if there is a God with the capacity to share, to literally share the experience, the joy, the suffering, suffering of the spider and the fly, what would that divine being's compassion be like? Mm -hmm. And how can mine be a tiny drop of it? So I'm a big fan of process of the process God I don't believe in, I think is a wonderful vision. And if the whole world had shared that vision, it would be a better world, okay, than one with other visions of God, mm -hmm. where God is cruel and not responsive and not suffering with us. So, uh, but I think we can love each other either way. Mm -hmm. I think we can have hope, however you think about that issue. But I love this passage, and I'll leave it with you. Go forth. Be compassionate. Have hope. Create yourselves well. Okay? Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. You may, you may not be comfortable using the word God, but you know how to preach a sermon. I, uh, you know, so so uh, everyone on, uh, on the stream, we'll be back in uh, 18 minutes okay. uh, with Mary Elizabeth Moore. But it's a different link. Um, that you got in your email, but if you're on the YouTube page, it's the same YouTube page. Uh, but thank you, Bob. That was wonderful. Thank you, thank you very much.